let's start with the geometric growth of the K, lesson number six on page 52. So class example number one. And so what we're looking at is uh, an article about exploding bunny population at uh, UVic. It's saying in 2010, there was an estimated 1500 rabbits on the grounds. And so if they were projecting that there would be an increase of 20% per year. So completing the table, we have a couple of options. I know that some of you guys would look at doing 1500 multiplied by 0 decimal 2 for 20% and then figuring out that that is an increase of 300 and then adding 1500 plus the 300 to make 1800. And so that would be in 2010, there are 1500 rabbits in 2011. 1,800 rabbits, and then we can continue that process, 1,800 times 0 decimal 2 is equal to 360, and 1,500 plus 360 is, oops, sorry, 1,800 plus 300. 60 is equal to 2,160 and continue that for 2013 to determine that there are 2,592 bunnies projected to be on campus. So if we want to show that the population is geometric, then we know that there must be a common ratio, which is term 2 divided by term 1 or 1,800 divided by 1,500 that equals to one decimal two. Um, again, we can check that with term three, 2,160 divided by 1,800. And again, we'll see that that is one decimal two. And we can check it again with 2,592 divided by 2,160 to see that the common ratio is in fact um, one decimal two then is our common ratio. So that tells us as well that up here, what we could have done instead is rather than 1500 times 0 decimal 2 is equal to 300, then adding it on, we could have essentially multiplied 1500 times 1 decimal 2 to get 1800. And similarly, 1800 times 1 decimal 2 would equal 2160 and 2160 multiplied by 1 decimal 2 will give us 2,592. So it kind of saves us um, a bit of work there by just applying the common ratio. So if term 1 in the sequence is the number of rabbits in 2010, then which term of the sequence represents the number of rabbits in 2025? So again, going back up here, remember what I'd recommended to you guys is taking a look and even adding in a third row or a third column depending on how you have your table organized. So if we have our term number, also known as n of course, if this is term 1, this is term 2, this is term 3, and this is term 4, then taking a look at if we've got then 2025, what is the relationship between the year and our term number? And so in some cases people say, well, 2012 and then down to term 3, so then that's essentially taking 12 minus 3 or that's minus 9. So if we look at that, then we could say 2025 minus 9 would essentially give us term 16. term 16. So estimate the rabbit population at UVic in January of 2025. So we know that we're using our A value, our T1 is equal to 1,500, R is equal to 1 decimal 2, and our term number is 16. So our general formula Tn is equal to A times R to the N minus 1, or term 16, not 15 is equal to 1500 to times 1 decimal 2 to the 16 minus 1 or 1500 times 1 decimal 2 to the 15th. So you can enter that into your calculator as is um, using obviously the hat button for the exponent and we'll end up with term 16 is 
going to give us 23,110 decimal 53 and on and on it goes um, and so that's a lot of bunnies so our estimate because again that 20 percent increase that's not going to be exact and so the estimate will be about 23,110 rabbits reading through the note so we know that the geometric growth factor or in this case of course this is also our common ratio is one decimal two okay. so looking at geometric decay difference of course between growth and decay is that growth it's getting bigger decay things are definitely getting smaller so there's Vinny, and he's borrowing $10,000 from his parents to buy a car. And his parents lend him the money interest-free. That's awfully nice. Um, provided that he makes a payment at the end of each year. So they agree on um, Vinny owing 10% less at the end of a particular year than at the beginning of that year. And the repayment scheme lasts for eight years and then at the end of the eight years, he's going to make just one giant payment, um, regardless of what that is. We can certainly figure that out to pay off the loan. So how much does he owe at the end of each of the first four years? So knowing that at the start of the year, he's borrowed 10000 he's owing 10% less. So what are we looking at is 10000 So if we're looking at year one, He's got 10,000, he's got to pay back 10%. So we have to figure out what 10% or 0 0.1 is. And I hope you guys don't need to write this all out, but, um, or use your calculator, recognizing that 10% of 10,000 is $1,000. And so once he pays that off, then it's 10,000 minus the $1,000 that he's paid off. So that means that at the end of year one, so maybe we write down end of year one, one, he's only 9,000. So if we fill that into the table, same thing. At the end of year two, he's got $9,000 and he's got to pay off 10%. And paying off 10% is going to be paying off $900. So then 9,000 minus $900. So at the end of year two, he now owes $8,100. Continuing that process, we'll see at the end of year three, it's 7,290, and then at the end of year four, $6,561 is what he's owing. So if we know that the values are forming a geometric sequence, then calculating the common ratio, uh, we know then again that common ratio is term two divided by term one, or 8,100 divided by 9,000, and that equals 0 0.9. Similarly, we can also see that r is equal to term 3 divided by term 2, 7,290 divided by 8,100, and again, that equals 0 0.9. So our common ratio, and I think many of you would have predicted that already, um, is owing 10% less, so 100% minus 10%, then each value is 90% of the one before. So your geometric growth factor is also known as your common ratio, and so r is equal to 0 0.9. So how much does he owe at the end of the seventh year? So noticing that we're using the first term as $9,000. Why? Because we're working at the end of the year. Okay, and so um, if you're choosing to use 10,000, then that is at the beginning of the first year. So conceivably, you could use A is equal to 10,000, but the amount owing at the end of the seventh year will be the same as the beginning of the eighth year. So that's where putting it into context, knowing what your end value represents is going to make the difference. So if we use A is equal to 9,000, our common ratio or your growth factor is 0 0.9 and the end of the seventh year n is equal to 7 so the term 7 is equal to 
a times r to the n minus 1, or 9,000 times 0 decimal 9. That is all to the 7 minus 1, or to the 6. And then term 7 is going to give us $4,782. And of course, being money, we're going to round that to the nearest hundreds. And that's how much it still owes. Okay, so you can see that geometric growth factor, where the factor is between 0 and 1, we're looking at geometric decay. Okay. So growth factor in each of the following situations. So key thing looking at, is it increasing or decreasing? Because it's increasing by 3.5%, then your common ratio will be 1.035, or 103 1.035.5%. So 1.035, in this case we're looking at decreasing, so we're taking away 2%, so then it's 0 0.98. If the population is doubling each year, then we're looking at a 200% or 2, a growth factor of 2. If it decreases by 1 fifth, then we're looking at 4 fifths, or some of you may also look at 0 0.8 would work. If the ball rebounds to three quarters of its previous height, then that's already giving us what the growth factor or the geometric decay is. It's three quarters. It's losing 25%. It's keeping 75% or three quarters. So either or decimal or fraction, um, how do you know which one to use? Well, again, it's uh, depending on the values that are given. If you're given fractions, typically keep it in fractions. If you're given decimals, keep it in decimals. If your fraction is going to be um, something that's a repeating decimal or really long, then preferably keep it in fraction form. Okay, let's take a look at class example four. So a rubber ball is dropped from a top of a building 20 meters high. Each time the ball bounces, it's bouncing back up to 80% of its previous height. So calculating to the nearest centimeter. So you can also notice that we've got a difference of units, the height of the ball after the 15th bounce. So we've got Lucasito, who decides to solve the problem using a geometric sequence, where term 1, or our A value, is 20. And so why does T15 not give the answer to the problem? So again, having to do with context. So if you imagine that this is my building that is 20 meters tall, and the ball gets dropped from there, and it bounces up to... 80% of its height bounces again, then this is the first bounce, this is the second bounce. So if you're saying then we want term 15, term 15 is, well, what does your n represent? In this case, with term 1 being 20, 20 is the height before the first bounce. So if T1 is equal to 20, then N is equal to the bounce, or I should say Tn is the height before the nth bounce. So that means that T15 is the height before bounce, whereas we're looking for the height after the 15th bounce. Okay, so if we use Lucasito's method, then, well, we're going to get the wrong answer, but let's take a look at what we're going to see. Then. So we're using, he's got A or T1 as being 20. Um, your common ratio, because it's 80% of its previous height, then it is 0 decimal 8. And our N, he's choosing to use 15. So term 15 is equal to A times R to the N minus 1, or 20 um, times 0 decimal 8 to the 14th or from 
comes out too, then zero decimal. Oops, I've got the wrong answer here. So that would come out to zero decimal eight seven nine six, but of course that's in meters. So if I want to change that to centimeters, then it's going to be approximately eighty-eight centimeters then. If we wanted to do the proper um, the proper method, we're going to be looking at n is equal to 16. And because the height before the 16th bounce is the same as the height after the 15th bounce. And this would give Lucasito the correct answer. So t16 then is going to be 20 times 0 decimal 8 to the 15th because it's 16 minus 1, and that then will give us an answer of 0 decimal 7036 meters or approximately 70 centimeters. Okay. So Nicolette argues the value of term 15 should be the solution um, to the problem. So again, just adjusting in context. So um, with that, Nicolette's sequence does not equal, or her first term, her a value, doesn't equal 20, because why? If t15 is going to be the height of the ball after the 15th bounce, then t1 must be the height after the first bounce. So then height after um, the first bounce will be equal to 0 0.8 times 20, in which case that would be uh, okay, so 0 decimal 8 times 20 is going to give us 16. Okay. So using Nicolette's method, then she is of course finding term 15 because it's the height after the 15th bounce with her A value equal to 16 meters and we're looking at n is equal to 15 and again a common ratio stays at 80 percent so t15 is a r to the n minus 1 or 16 times r being 0 decimal 8 to the 15 minus 1 or 14 and that gives us 0 decimal 7036 meters or approximately 70 centimeters. Okay. So for each student, write an equation which represents the height of the ball after x bounces. So for Lucasito, so after x bounces, then he is looking at the height being 20 times 0 decimal 8 to the x, whereas for Nicolette, we're looking at the height is equal to 20 times 0 decimal 8 to the x minus 1. So I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, why not just go for Lucasito because x is then the number of bounces, but Nicolette, remember, is using our geometric sequence formula. Okay. So if we're looking at which uh, writing an equation that could be solved, some of them determine the minimum number of bounces required for the rebound height to be less than two centimeters, and we're essentially looking at two is equal to, because that's our rebound height. Um, in some cases, I might argue that this should be inequality as opposed to um, an inequality as opposed to an equation. Okay. So if you're using the intersection feature on your graphing calculator, again, what are we looking for? We're looking at y1 is equal to your left side, y2 is equal to your right side, and then calculating the intersection point. So regardless of what we see, um, either way that you're solving, x will equal approximately 10.3, 1.
And so we know that 10 bounces is not going to be enough. So that means that it will take 11 bounces are required. Let's look at the last example on compound interest. So compound interest is where Mike invests $5,000 in a GIC and each year 3% interest is added to the value of the investment at the beginning of the year. And we'll look at different scenarios um, when I return just about um, the fact that not all investments thankfully pay annually. Some of them will pay you multiple times during the year and uh, compound is of course always going to be better than simple interest when it comes to investments. So if it's earning 3% interest, then the growth factor will be 1.03. So the product, um, which represents the value of the investment after one year, is going to be 5,000 times 1.03. And so after two years, of course, we multiply by 1.03 again. And I think that you guys recognize that now we can start using our exponents. So 1.03 squared with our exponent being the number of years. So using that formula then to calculate the value of the investment after 10 years, then, well, term one is going to be after one year will be 5,000 times 1.03, right? So that's after the first year. Notice how we're not using $5,000 because that would be at the beginning of the first year. So R is equal to 1.03. So then Tn is equal to A times R to the N minus 1, or term 10 is equal to 5,000 times 1.03, right? That's your A value times your R value, which is 1.03 to the 10 minus 1, or 9, so which is the same as 5,000 times 1.03 to the 10. Okay, so the value of the investment after one year will be 5,000 times 1.03 or 5,150 dollars. After two years, 5,000 times 1.03 squared, which is 5,304 dollars and 50 cents. After 10 years, 5,000 times 1.03 to the tenth, which is $6,719.58. So using our general formula for geometric sequences, if we are writing a formula, then you can kind of see what you're, you've done with E above. Um, as a power with exponent n. So if we know that a or t1 is equal to 5,000 times 1.03, because that's the amount after the first year, again, r is equal to 1.03, then tn is equal to a times r to the n minus 1, or 5,000 times 1.03, that's your a value, this whole thing is your a value, times 1.03 to the n minus 1. But then what we recognize is that n minus 1 is the same as dividing by um, 1.03, which in essence cancels out one of our 1.03s, and so then that's why we just have 5,000 times 1.03 to the n, and that kind of matches what we've got here, that confirms what we have.
So just using different variables because um, it's pretty standard to recognize the compound interest formula. So if P is essentially, P will equal your principal. Um, and so R is going to be your common ratio. So what we have then is A, the amount that we'll end up with, is equal to P times 1 plus your interest. And so um, because they've got it written as I percent, then to put it in as a decimal, then we want to divide that by 100. And the exponent will be however many years it is invested for. Okay, and that's it.